Thank you very much for waiting, everyone. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll get started. Um, thank you very much for attending this webinar. Um, I'm primarily going to be speaking about Microsoft Splar, um, just on the licensing, and also we'll have a touch on from Curam on hybrid cloud, which um, involves both Microsoft Splar and other volume licensing agreements. Um, following that, we'll have a, a, a lead in from um, Mike Nicholas, um, who's our head of services in Grey Matter, in order to explain the services um, offering that you can offer to your customers. So the agenda is pretty much just going to be around the, the licensing models um, that are currently available. Uh, we'll then have an, a brief overview. We'll then have an understanding of what is SPLA. Um, following that, uh, we'll go through uh, is SPLA right for your business, then the benefits and features, eligibility and requirements, how to participate through Grey Matter, um, the licensing model, then Curran will explain hybrid cloud, um, we'll provide example pricing, follow on with the reporting process, and then we'll touch on the services and any questions you guys have. So first, the uh, licensing channel models. So effectively, this is how SPLAR sits um, across other agreements. So in all cases, Microsoft sits on top of the IP holder. Um, in SPLAR, the uh, Microsoft then sells through uh, the SPLAR reseller, uh, which in this case is Grey Matter. Um, we then enroll the service provider, and uh, each service provider would sell a service, a software service, not the licenses, a software service to its end customers. In other channel models, typically you'll go through a, um, an LSP or VAR as an end user. So an overview of exactly um, uh, how licensing sits for, in terms of internal use and external use. Um, in internal use, the end user is a licensee. Uh, the union of product terms typically do not permit rental, lease, lending, or commercial hosting in any way, shape, or form. There's no third-party hosting rights. And the type of licensing program that it's applied to is OEM, um, full package products are boxed, um, open licensing or open value, um, select and select plus for retired agreements or MPSA and GVL um, for current agreements, and enterprise agreements and any educational agreements. Um, for external use, where the end user is not the licensee, uh, the service provider would typically be the licensee in this case, um, which is where th they're providing a software service for third-party use, where the, the, the service provider use rights, which is the SPUR, allows for hosting, renting, and leasing of the Microsoft products. And this program is under SPUR, which is what the webinar is going to be talking about today. So I'll be going through um, the effectively what SPLAR is exactly. So it's a licensing agreement for Microsoft products to be reported on a monthly basis to host software services and applications for your end users. It's not um, allowing you to sell licenses to another party, like a reseller or distributor would. It's, a, it's not a reseller program. It's, it's, a, it's a licensing agreement for service providers to make Microsoft products available to end users with their own services. Splar offers flexibility, unlike most programs. So you can actually report and pay for license usage each month in arrears. There's no volume commitment, and the reporting payments are based on a monthly cash flow model with minimal upfront stock investment, which suits businesses of all sizes, whether they are large or small. The term of the agreement is three years, and it can be extended at request and approval by Microsoft. With SPLAR, the prices can decrease at any time, um, but only during January the 1st, or at any time to offset, offset currency fluctuations other than US dollar, um, would be when Microsoft increased the SPLAR prices. SPLAR prices don't contain volume discounts. So whether you're reporting a single license or a thousand licenses, the unit price will be the same. So there's no discount empowerment across any sector or industry. The types of organizations that you would use for are, um, are typically shown here. So independent software vendors um, who host business applications 
that are consumed by end users through the internet, for example, they would be typically licensing the service through Splat. The other type of industry will be service providers who create their own business solutions, um, and end users would typically consume those through the internet once again. Um, they would normally not have uh, their own intellectual property and typically build a white label along with an old, another third party's IP. Splash supports a variety of hosting scenarios. Um, and the final one is uh, MSPs. So any organization that wants to build their own business services practice um, using their own or a third party's data center infrastructure uh, would typically be licensing through SPLA. With SPLA, uh, both service providers and ISVs will be licensing those eligible products on a monthly basis to end that three-year term. So what is SPLA exactly? So as an ISV or service provider, you would need to provide software services that interact with your products, Microsoft products, to end users. For example, if you provide your end user with a hosted website or line of business application through Microsoft software under SPLA, um, this would typically have to be licensed under SPLA because it's a hosted uh, website or line of business application. Um, with Microsoft licensing, you don't, you, it does not normally permit hosting. As, as discussed earlier. So an example of this would be an ISV that creates a CRM cloud-based application, such as a, a SaaS-driven model, whereby the end users would interact with the Microsoft products through an intermediate product. The ISV would involve through the SPLAR program or work in conjunction with a hosting provider who is involved through the SPLAR program. And they will typically report those licenses based on uh, the SPUR um, the service provider use rights, which is licensing and governing the SPLA terms. Now, the question for every business is, is SPLA right for me? Now, under SPLA, um, it's an opportunity for any organization, whether you're a service provider or an ISV, um, to acquire those Microsoft products and license them as, a, uh, as your own organization. Um, in order to license your end users, which then does not mean that your end users have to acquire their own licenses under their own licensing agreements, which can be quite complicated. Now, with SPLA, the licensee is actually the service provider or the IC, not the end user, because the service provider is responsible for reporting those licenses to Microsoft for any usage that is on, on their SPLA through its authorized reseller. Now, some business models and scenarios where SPLA uh, is appropriate for uh, typically is, is the ones listed here. So any business who wants to provide hosted services to an entity of an individual that's not an employee, an on-site agent, affiliation, or contractor may want to consider SPLA. Now, without SPLA, your end user would need to acquire their own licenses. And to be able to deploy to shared infrastructure those licenses would, e would need to have license mobility through software assurance. So for server applications like Microsoft SQL Server, um, this adds uh, additional cost onto a, onto a software license and requires the end user to maintain that ongoing software assurance benefit. Now the data center provider would require SPLA for the Windows platform in order to provide shared infrastructure platform services to its customers. Windows Server does not have license mobility through self assurance, so the data center provider would have to enroll to SPLA. Microsoft software typically does not permit commercial hosting without the appropriate licensing agreement. Now we're going through the benefits and features of SPLA. Um, with SPLA, there is no upfront cost, as mentioned earlier, it's pay as you go, very much like the CSP licensing model, if you're already familiar with that provides access to the most current product versions. It's not the same as software assurance though, so please don't confuse the two. With SPLA, you also have up to 20 administrators per data center. You can internally test and evaluate for 90 days, so you can test your solution before you sell it onto your end users. You can provide demonstrations to customers, up to 50 users at any given time, and you can also provide 60-day trials to prospective end users. 
the licensing terms allow worldwide license usage. Not all agreements allow this. Um, typically, enterprise agreements or NGVL or select, for example, do allow this. The other thing is that uh, academic pricing is available. Um, government pricing is also available, but only through the commercial price list. So there is no discount empowerment for government entities anymore. That's going to be removed in July. Um, the, you can outsource your data center provider to another provider like Microsoft Azure, for example, or any other hosted um, infrastructure provider to provide those software services to your end users. You can also install on an end user facility such as uh, dedicated hardware under, under your day-to-day -day control and management. And as a special benefit of SPLAR, to promote you to sell more licenses to your customers um, through your own customer usage model, you can report up to 50% internal use rights for any licenses that you report to Microsoft. However, the revenue must be reported on your SPLAR, and the requirement is down to a per SKU le level. So now we're going through the eligibility. So you must maintain an, your status as a Microsoft Partner Network, so you must be enrolled. You must also work with a SPLA reseller to sign an indirect SPLA and the MBSA and any other required contracts. You can report on a monthly basis, um, and it is an obligation to do so, whether it's a zero report or not. You can provide technical support to your customers. So any products that you report onto your supply, you have an obligation to provide technical support for, whether that's yourself or in a, an outsourced partner. You have a requirement to comply with the SPUR and pass on those license terms to your end users. And you must agree to participate in SPAR audits and comply with the export laws, such as not exporting to any embargoed countries. In order to participate with SPLAR, you would contact the ISV hosting team at Grey Matter. So that's ISV at um, You would also need to get it verified by a, a licensing specialist, such as myself or any of my colleagues. You would then need to submit the required information to Grey Matter to enroll you to SPLA. You would then sign the documents um, that we send to you through the electronic agreement portal. Once you receive your SPLA acceptance notice, you can then enjoy the benefits of SPLA. And if you have any issues, you can call us directly. Now, with the licensing model, um, it should be fairly similar to your existing models that you would have already in place. So the SAL model is quite similar to the CAL model. So SAL stands for subscriber access licenses, whereby you only license the individual users or devices based on authorized access, not actual access. So whether, you, whether your end user accesses your licensed infrastructure or not, it's based on what all you have permitted within your infrastructure. That's how you report the licenses. You do not need a server license, and multiplexing does not reduce your required licenses. So if there's a calling device, for example, uh, you, whether that's an, a an IAS or web API, um, you would need to license all user access. Now, the process of licensing is hopefully familiar with what's something else you've came across before. However, with one slight difference in that there is no CALs or SALs required in the process of license model. You have unlimited users, and you license based on physical processes, um, and there is no, once again, no separate SALs required. Now, the core licensing model should also be similar to your existing models in that um, each core license that you assign um, as per the SPUR would allow you to have an unlimited number of users to access that service software installed on your server without a, another SAL. So you would determine the physical or virtual cause, and licensing the virtual cause in a virtual machine would need you to count the hyper-threaded cause, which means if you've enabled hyper-threading technology, uh, that might increase your license cost. The eight-core licensing minimum applies to Windows Server on System Center, and the four-core licensing minimum applies to all other core products, such as SQL Server and BizTalk Server. License mobility permits you to reassign your licenses from one of your servers to another of your servers in the same server farm as often as you need to. Now, Microsoft definition, a server farm is a single data center or two data centers physically located 
either in a time zone not more than four hours apart or within EU EFTA. So a license can be moved from one server to another, but not on a short-term basis if it's across to another server farm. Now I'll be passing over to Kuram in order to uh, elaborate on the hybrid cloud licensing model. So he'll be explaining uh, exactly how you can license in a hybrid cloud model. So if you just bear with me, I will pass it over to him in order to present his his aspect. Right, okay. Um, hi everyone, and thank you again for joining this webinar. Uh, as David mentioned, I am Karam Iqbal. I work in, the, in Microsoft in the UK hosting team I, as, a, as a license and sales specialist. So I've been looking after Spla for about seven years uh, now. Uh, and Spla has seen a massive growth in recent years. Uh, and But with that, actually, it comes to, it comes of a fact that basically we have not just Spla but other licensing programs that also offer Microsoft products but with different use rights. Uh, and we always um, uh, kind of um, uh, talked about hybrid licensing and it, I've been in this world for seven years and we've talked about hybrid licensing ever since but we have never had that level of, com um, that level of uh, flexibility in our licensing program that would basically support license hybrid licensing that I would see or right now that we're talking about. Um, so there was always something missing at least um, uh, somewhere in the puzzle that thought basically hybrid licensing if you're not there yet. But I think today when we're talking about hybrid licensing I think I can confidently, I can confidently say that we have all the all the right sort of offers that will basically support what you might typically call a hybrid cloud scenario. Now there is a definition right there in front of your screen. Uh, there are many ways of putting together what hybrid licensing would look like. But let me just talk about and break it down into a few, few things, what I mean by that. So if you think about a scenario, obviously um, this slide works for me. Uh, yep. Um, so what we have, we have tr three typical types of cloud, data center types, if you want to call it. What you have is customer on-premises. Uh, on that, basically, what we're talking about is a traditional scenario where customers will have their data centers running on-premises. This might be a scenario where they will have an outsourcer running dedicated physical set of servers for them, kind of a colo as well. Um, which basically essentially is the same. It, the, the server hardware is dedicated, customer mainly controls it, they, they might have some support from an outsourcer, but this has been the traditional world where a customer would buy the licenses and use it for their internal use. Um, it has been there all the time. And then we've had some partner hosted scenario, Spla has been there at least for, for about 14, 15 years now, uh, and they basically support scenario where a service provider, service provider like you will spin up their own data center and services along with it and deliver to their customers. So it's not going to be licensed by a customer, it will be licensed by the service provider. And now we've got Microsoft Cloud, which basically is an online set of services, obviously delivered through Microsoft's own data center. Uh, maybe it's Office 365, Azure, and there are other services like CRM Online or 365 actually, uh, Intune, all that. So anything that is delivered by Microsoft Cloud or public cloud uh, in a generic term, that is another another uh, uh, part of the hybrid cloud mix. So I mean, when you think about all these clouds, what effectively you've got as Microsoft is 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 consistent platform whereby you've got three different types of uh, clouds working together um, and and there are scenarios where you would might so for, for, from a, from a from a from a technical point of view you would have customers willing to use partner hosted services as well as some of the Microsoft cloud services a good example would be a customer using a line of business application from being delivered by uh, a partner hosted uh, platform and then also using Office 365 perhaps uh, on Microsoft Cloud. So it's possible and also they might have some of, some of their own file and print share, some of the uh, really basic internal um, uh, workloads that might be running on their own premises. So the idea here is that you will have in reality some certain customers that may be using any of these clouds or maybe all of them at the same time. And that's where the complexity comes in because as you can see, 
I'll show you in a moment that all these clouds are licensed in different ways using different licensing programs and the complexity is how do you navigate the A, the first obviously the workloads around whether the contracts used for it allow them and also how you manage all those contracts. So what I'm going to talk about right now is firstly which contracts we are talking about in, term, in respect to each of these clouds and what are the offerings that would support the hybrid cloud scenarios. So let's take this slide further ahead. So what we have, if you look at the customer on-premises, so customer on-premises are we're typically talking about licensing uh, programs that are called internal use or the license program for internal use. Um, what we have here is OLP or Open License Program, OBS, Open Value Subscription, something you would have heard of anyway, um, MPSA or Microsoft Product and Services Agreement, and Enterprise Agreement. So all these programs are there for customers to buy licenses within and use it for internal purposes. They can't use the software bought under these programs to deliver service to third parties, for example. Um, so yeah, so they would have these their data centers licensed under these programs uh, for, 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 for the internal purposes. And then we've got the Microsoft Cloud, which could be licensed or bought under a cloud solutions provider program or CSP and enterprise agreement as well. You can also license it an, under an open, but I've just, just for the simplicity's sake, I've just kept EA just to demonstrate that actually you could either license it under an internal use licensing program or we have a reseller program, which is obviously a CSP program as well. Um, in partner hosted, we have only, the only option we've got is SPLA, which we are talking about today. So this is where you would license your set of services that is underpinned by Microsoft technology being delivered to your customers, you will need a SPLA license. So as you can see, you've got number of different licensing programs all by Microsoft and all carry similar and sometimes different licensing uh, terms as well as use rights. So for example, for SPLA, you have a separate document as David mentioned, it's service provider use rights, but that's not the same for perhaps an EA, which is uh, product terms which is total, a, a, a much different document than a SPUR. Uh, and then for CSP, for example, for the Microsoft Online Services, you have Online Services Terms, or OST. So all carry different set of terms and use rights, and that's where the complexity comes in. So now let's talk about some of the offerings that I'm uh, looking to talk about here that would support scenarios like these where you, you, you might find your customers in. So let's go the next step further. So let's look in the customer premises first. Uh, you have, uh, let me see, actually there's one missed out due to probably editing. Uh, that's fine, I'll, I'll talk about it anyway. Um, so what we are looking at, actually there are three options there uh, within customer on-premises. One is the license mobility. Uh, this is license mobility through software issuance. Don't confuse it with the the, the the other license mobility which David was referring to earlier. That is called license mobility within a server farm. That's a different thing altogether. Uh, so let me talk about really briefly on license mobility through software assurance. This basically uh, is, is a software assurance benefit, which means it is only available under open licensing, MPSA and EA. Software assurance is not an option under SPLA. So customers who have software assurance would be able to leverage this benefit by not only installing these licenses on their own platform or on their own internal data centers, but they can also move it from their data center to partner hosted or onto Microsoft Cloud. For example, an exchange server. Uh, the customer might have an exchange server and they might not want to run it themselves. They would want a partner to run it for them on their data center. For many of various reasons, they might not have the expertise, they might have the licenses and, up the, and the upgrade rights, but they might not have the expertise to maintain or upgrade to. So partner hosted becomes an ideal scenario where for partners it, it's an opportunity where they can come in and basically provide this as a service without any additional cost to the customer from a licensing point of view because effectively customers using their own exchange server licenses with CALS and software assurance of course, and partner hosted is just basically bundling that uh, and underpinning that with the with the infrastructure licenses that obviously partner would have to pay for which is Windows Server and System Center typically. So that's, a, that's an example where license mobility would come in handy because in, in an, an alternative scenario where the customer doesn't have licenses or if they can't leverage license mobility, the partner or the partner hosted would need to not only license Windows Server and System Center, 
but they will also need to license the Exchange Server and Display. So it kind of helps that. So, it, so basically, customer on-premises licenses are supporting that scenario that partner hosted can deliver the same set of services without having to buy additional set of licenses. Um, same can also apply if, let's say, the customer wants to say, I want to move my workloads, the licenses I've got, onto Azure instead. That's also possible, like, like I mentioned, uh, for, for partner hosted. Um, we've also got the within license mobility or similar effect to license mobility is called the uh, remote desktop services extended use rights, uh, which basically means that not only customers can move their licenses, uh, such as Exchange Server, SQL Server, or uh, Skype for Business, they can also use their RDS CALs with software assurance that they've got. For example, if they are consuming any hosted desktop services from one of their partner hosted uh, platforms, then they could use their RDS CALs with software assurance if they have them to connect into any of the sessions that the partner hosted might be running for them, uh, rather than the partner hosted looking to uh, license anything under supply instead. So again, this, the idea is that you can you can use your same set of RDS CALs that you're using it internally. You can you, you, that having that CAL with software assurance gives you the ability to connect not only your internal um, data centers, but you can also connect into partner hosted. And also, you can also connect into any sessions that you might be running into Azure. Again, supporting the, the whole notion of hybrid cloud. Then you've got the Azure Hub, which basically uh, is, 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 is the ability for customers to use their own Windows Server images or Windows Server licenses, I should say, to be able to apply them on to upload them onto Azure. Let's say they bought uh, some of the Azure compute. Uh, but without the Windows uh, Windows OS within the compute. So they just pay for the compute and upload their own Windows Server images, which obviously carries the licenses as well. So they don't have to pay for any Windows licenses within Azure if they, let's say, have lots of Windows Server licenses that, that perhaps they might not be using. So if they've got software assurance on that, they can use that benefit as well. So again, that supports the notion of hybrid cloud whereby an on-premise licenses can now be used on a public cloud. I hope that makes sense. Now let's jump on to the other part, which is uh, for on the Microsoft Cloud side, which is Cal equivalency and the shared computer activation. Cal equivalency might basically say that what you have when you buy any Microsoft online services, typically the let's say talk about the uh, some of the um, on uh, the per user licensing models, such as the services you get for Office 365 and some of the services you get in Azure as well. You've got per user USLs as well. So in, in, in the online services, we don't have SALs or CALs. We have user subscriber license, user subscription licenses, so USLs, which basically is assigned to every user and maybe device in some cases. Uh, but that basically term to turns into a cow on certain scenarios. So for example, if a customer has E3 or E5, it's basically a suite of, uh, of USLs for um, Office Pro Plus, if you've got the um, Exchange, SharePoint, and in Skype for Business, uh, these would in, in, fa in effect act as CALs with software issuance as well. So if, if a customer has got E3, they can use these USLs to obviously connect into Microsoft Cloud Services, but also use these USLs as CALs as if they've bought these CALs to connect into their own internal servers. So effectively, you're buying Microsoft Cloud services, but you can use these licenses to connect into customer on-premises servers as well. They might have bought, installed a Skype for business server for whatever, whatever reasons. They might have an Exchange server, just a hybrid scenario, locally installed as well. So that would support uh, as well from a Cal equivalency rights perspective. Now, this would also help if you think about when we talked about license mobility through software assurance, effectively because the the USL becomes CALs with SA, you could leverage, as a customer, they could leverage these USLs to, to incorporate them with the uh, license mobility benefit, whereby they would use their, buy their own server licenses and port it onto their uh, service provider or partner hosted platform without having to buy any additional CALs with SA. They just need a server license with SA, and then they would use these USLs to connect into partner hosted by leveraging license mobility through software assurance. So, uh, and, I, and I'm really optimizing and kind of supporting the full hybrid cloud motion there. 
Um, the shared computer activation is is a scenario where it's kind of you might think about it as okay another license mobility scenario maybe for office but I would still use the terminology as shared computer activation which basically allows a customer who has bought Office 365 Pro Plus so the office component they've got within E3 or E5 they can obviously consume it directly from Microsoft Cloud but also they can put it on a um, Dex hosted desktop, let's say, in a session uh, on Azure, should they want it to, or they can basically ask a partner to basically deliver a hosted desktop to them, uh, whereby the hosted desktop would run on Windows Server and RDS. If the customer has got RDS CALs, with the say, brilliant, they can use their own RDS CALs, and then the customer will bring in their own Office 365 Pro Plus licenses rather than the service provider having to license it. So that's where the office licenses wouldn't need to buy, wouldn't need to be reported in the plot. The customer needs to bring in the Office Pro Plus licenses as well as RDS CALs, with us say, and all partner has to do is just provide Windows Server licenses and System Center, and obviously manage it for the customer. So again, you're buying the customer is buying online services products, but actually are able to use that on either on premises or on on partner hosted. And finally, uh, for for some of the SPLA relevant uh, benefits we're talking about here is the sales for SA. So sales for SA is, is is are only available for three types of products. So one is uh, Skype for Business, the other one is SharePoint and Exchange. So if any of your customers, and this is really interesting, would would be should, should be interesting for you is is that if you plan to become a service provider or plan to sign up to a SPLA or already have a SPLA contract in place. If you have any customers who have um, Exchange or SharePoint or um, Skype for business, uh, let's say they've bought some enterprise agreement or that they might have an OBS contract, typically these programs have got software assurance built in so they don't have a choice to opt out. Uh, and they typically would have got a core CAL or enterprise CAL, which is a, is a suite of CALs that includes all these products. Um, it's possible for some of the customers that they have bought the CALs but they might might not have the service, plainly because they just they just bought the cows and all, all the entire suite, but not realizing actually they could use these cows for other products that perhaps they don't have server license for. So it is for scenarios like that when actually they can't use license mobility because they also need the server licenses. You could help them use these products without so charging them too much actually because the sales for SA is a much much cheaper discounted SKU uh, than the normal sales so for example if you were to deliver Skype for Business services you would pay a price uh, whatever price that may be five six pounds dollars uh, per, per user per month but then the sales for SA would be significantly cheaper less than 50p per user per month just because you are delivering the same set of services to a customer who happens to have CALs of that product with software assurance. So if the customer has Skype for Business CALs with software assurance, you can use Skype for Business Salesforce say, for that customer and it's that cheap. So you just deliver that service, the same set of services, no limited functionality, same set of products. It's just that because the customer has invested on software assurance, you are able to deliver that. So it's a great opportunity for any partners who are working with customers who already have software assurance. On their accounts, hosted ISPs are slightly uh, on on the left side uh, on, on a different side. Uh, Note is it's probably obviously really interesting for for ISPs. So SPLA is one option for you, whereby you would build your own applications delivered from your data center to your customers. It's really flexible, no upfront commitment, and obviously you can report on a monthly basis. You can get up and down as you like it. Hosted ISV is a, is a software assurance benefit under an EA open or value subscription, whereby the so long as you are an ISV, you have built your own application uh, and it's a unified solution whereby the customer doesn't actually pay for infrastructure services or anything like that. You just pay, you just bundle a solution together and sell it as a solution to your customer being delivered from your own data center to your customers. Then you can have the alternative to license them under an EA or open value subscription or even MPSA if you if you buy a software assurance license software assurance with licenses uh, it's it's called self hosted self hosted applications uh, as as a benefit under the um, software assurance benefit so you are able to deliver the same set of functionality that you perhaps can do under SPLA 
with the difference being obviously that there are limitations when you think about open value subscription MPSA and EA that you have to buy a chunk of licenses at the start of the contract, it's an upfront commitment, uh, you can't go low let's say during, during any other month, you have to perhaps true up every year, so there are different different uh, differences as far as PLA versus uh, the hosted ISV is concerned. But again, it's another option should you wish to use that. So basically your customer on-premise license has become a partner hosted license in, that, in, in effect. So so that's that's the entire picture in terms of what offerings we've got. And I, I, see, I think you could probably appreciate how many different offerings we've got here and I kept on going supporting hybrid cloud, supporting hybrid cloud. And that's the notion here. We are supporting hybrid cloud. We, we want you to concentrate on hybrid cloud as well. So yes, partner hosted is a key thing, and I'm sure many of you would be interested in signing up to Splark contract or may already be delivering, uh, doing a great things through partner hosted. But you need to think about Microsoft Cloud as well if you're if you're if you're looking to become a CSP partner, or and obviously if you've got customers that have software assurance, then there are a number of ways you can pass on the savings for to these customers who have invested in software assurance through various offerings that I've just talked about. So yeah, um, I, I have a set of videos on that as well, so David will share a partner a link to our Yammer group where I share some of the readiness content regarding hybrid cloud, so if you have questions, please obviously fire away in this webinar or we can take it uh, offline as well. Uh, with that, I pass over to David, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Karam. I really appreciate your time on that. Explaining the hybrid licensing model uh, certainly will help a lot of people understand kind of which uh, cloud is right for them, and if they aren't sure, they can recycle their existing licenses. So really appreciate your time on that one, Karam. Um, if you could pass the control back to me, I'll get going on the SPLA licensing uh, pricing so that everyone has an understanding of exactly uh, what uh, licensing uh, prices are going to look like on SPLA. So uh, on the SPLA pricing, um, it's because it's per month, um, it's very minimalized in terms of uh, capital investment. So um, if in this example, um, an organ this is how a SPLA pricing would apply to their licensing requirements. So this, the example I've chosen is an organization that provides uh, its end users with indirect access to a, a, a website or a line of business application through, through Microsoft Server Products. Um, I've chosen to uh, provide pricing based on 12 physical cores, um, three virtual machines or operating system environments, um, with the physical machine used for managing those hosts, uh, as a host, those virtual guests. Uh, the SQL Server will be installed on a virtual machine with two virtual cores. Um, in the Windows element of how to license this, you would typically use standard edition because there's very little virtualization. Um, an eight core minimum would apply to each physical processor. So even though there are a six core processor, 12 physical cores in total, you still need to license all the eight, all eight cores. So a 16 core license will be required per operating system environment because there are uh, 16 cores in total with the minimum because it's a dual processor. Um, one instance in the physical machine would then be inclusive if it's only used to host and manage those virtual SCs. So you would need three virtual machines which total to 48 core licenses. Now, that's £84.24 pence per month currently, um, as of the June price list, which is a substantial difference in what you typically would have to pay for these, this type of uh, license rights. And there's no additional cows or sal requirement for the Windows at all in this scenario. Now, with SQL Standard Edition, a four-core minimum would apply to the virtual machine and any number of instances in that individual virtual machine on that license server can be run. Because of the uh, license mobility um, benefit on SPLA, which allows you to assign a license from one server to another within a server farm, you can also have that uh, server instance running on, a, uh, on, on your own infrastructure in a data center um, and have that highly available to your end users on the SPLA. And you can also have a failover environment set up for you, um, which is inclusive in the license cost. Now, a four-core license, because it's a four-core minimum, would cost 229 pence 
£229.78 uh, per month, which is once again subject to uh, price changes, and this is as per the June price list. Now, on the reporting element, you would have to report by the 10th of each month to your designated supplier reseller, which is Grey Matter, not to Microsoft. You would need to declare the end user country based on their um, location as a user. Um, you do not report based on where the server itself is located, unless it's a shared infrastructure. You would then need to consolidate any reports that you have from affiliations that are using your software services or reselling your software services, um, and also any software services resellers. A uh, $100 minimum would apply, starting no later than the sixth month of your supplier effective date. Now, this means from the seventh month, you cannot have zero usage or any usage less than $100, which is £90 in equivalency currently or 100 euros. If there is more than $1,000 in the month, then you would need to declare the end user name and address. Now this isn't for our information, it's for Microsoft. This is to allow the end user to be recognized individually on your master agreement for billing purposes. $1,000 equates about £900 currently, or 1,000 euros. Now you can submit report revisions, which means that if you do make a mistake, um, you can request an adjustment within 60 days from that invoice date. Anything later than that needs to be escalated. Um, now, if you do need to do this, you would need to provide an explanation of the uh, revision. You can report zero usage um, for the first six months of your agreement if you have zero licenses consumed by your end users. After that period, there are no more zero usage reports permitted because of the minimum requirements. Now I'm going to be passing over to uh, my colleague Sally because, because unfortunately Mike Nicholas is unable to join us today as he's uh, is not well. Uh, but Sally will be touching on the cloud services uh, that Grey Matter can offer um, and any other additional resources that we can provide to you. Hello, um, I'm Sally Green. I'm team lead for the ISV team. So I'm going to be covering off um, Mike's slides today. Um, so this is about some of the services that Grey Matter can offer you as an ISB or as a service provider to your customers to help you to enhance your application to make sure it is stable so that you have a fully stable environment for your customers and it is fully supported in the way that you'd want it to. So there are various ways that we can help you. Um, we can help you design your solution. So we can look at the architecture of your application, make sure it is stable and it is scalable, just for now, but for the future as well, because the last thing you want to be doing is releasing an application and then finding in two years' time, you've got to totally rewrite and re-architecture because it can't be scalable. So we make sure that we factor all those pieces in for you. We can migrate your application for you. Um, which if you're currently on-premise and you want to go to hybrid or fully cloud, we can help you with that. Um, again, we will look at your application and make sure that it is totally functionable so your customers do not have any problems or any lack of functionality when you move to cloud. Um, we can do recovery services for you. So um, backup as a service, um, whether you want us to be hands-on, just setting it up and then you want to manage it afterwards, it's entirely up to you. Or we will manage that for you and we will make sure that it is regularly tested to make sure that if by any means there is a problem and we do need to pull in the backup and we do need to bring it back up to life again, that it is fully functional and we can do that within the required SLAs. We can offer 24-7, 365 support. At the moment, um, our basic support is um, 9 to 5.30 office hours with a two-hour SLA. Typically, at the moment, we are running at about um, 20 minutes for us to be starting working on your problems through the service desk, um, but our SLAs are two hours. Um, if you need out-of-hours support, we can make sure that is arranged for you as well. And we can offer user and admin training 
so we can help you get up there and be functional but then we can help you train so that you don't need our full on 24-7 support you can manage it yourself moving forwards we can be as hands on or as hands off as you need us to be you just need to let us know what you need and we will make sure that we can get that for you and cost it accordingly um, so we've got a quote from um, one of our customers Intact Software so Grey Matter has provided Intact with expert licensing advice and best of breed development tools and in turn enabled a cloud managed infrastructure that significantly scales, scales and our reach while minimizing our total costs so part of this and part of the solution design is that we make sure you're using your servers to the best of their ability and functionality to make sure you're not overpaying what you don't need. Thank you, Sally. I really appreciate all of that um, and stepping in where mics are available. Um, so I'll move on to the final slide of today, which is the resources slide. So I would strongly suggest you take a look at all of these links and of course get in touch with the ISP and hosting team. Uh, the UK partner licensing Yama Group is something that Chrome himself publishes a lot of information about licensing on. Um, so I, I do once again strongly suggest that. Um, and at this point I'll be happy to take any questions that anyone has. Um, if you'd like to pose any questions you have on the, uh, the window here. Thank you very much for everyone's attendance today. Uh, I do really appreciate it and um, have a good week and in, of course get in touch when you're ready. Thank you very much.